Thank you for spending uh, this, our Christmas Sunday, our Christmas service with us. We do trust that you will be blessed, but that you will be blessed in a very particular way, that, that you will be blessed through a fresh, maybe for some here, a new certainty of the one that we're celebrating this morning, that Jesus, this baby born in a manger who would grow up and die on a cross and who is seated at the right hand of God right now, that you would have a certainty that he is who he says he is and that that would transform your life. Would you please click or slide or open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke? If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, there's a Bible in front of you. Uh, It's a blue Bible just like this one, and I believe that our passage is on page 857 this morning. We are going to be looking at Luke's record of the birth of Jesus this morning in Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. And as you're turning there, uh, one, of my, one of the things I love to do, and I've done it to some of you out there, is every Christmas I love to ask people this question. Is Christmas big in your home? Is Christmas a big thing in your home? One of the reasons I love to ask it is because the looks I get are comical. Some of them are, they reveal confusion. I don't understand the question exactly. Some of them, the times, are even self-righteous. Usually the answers that I get to that question are mixed And almost always, the person's response seems to to reveal that they understand my question in terms of Christmas trees, Christmas lights, and Christmas gifts. And so the question seems to be typically perceived as, do we really get into the traditional Christmas spirit? Well, for the record, Christmases are big in my home. Christmases are big in the Overstreet family. In the Overstreet family, we enjoy our Christmas tree. We enjoy our Christmas lights. I particularly enjoy the Christmas lights now that I have moved from the string of lights to the little laser that takes me five minutes to put up and five minutes to take down and no knots in between. In the Overstreet home, we, we, we enjoy, we relish Christmas movies and our friends around the warm fireplace. We savor the Christmas Day prime rib dinner. We look forward to blessing one another with gifts. In the Overstreet home, we, we, we take pleasure in our Christmas traditions. But those traditions are not ultimately what makes Christmas big in the Overstreet household. Those traditions that are wonderful, that can be a blessing, that can be fun to to hand down to your children, ultimately, they're not what makes Christmas big. The bigness of Christmas transcends any and all traditions that we can come up with, even something like a church service on Christmas Eve where you end by lighting candles and singing together. The ingredients of a truly big Christmas are found in Luke 2 this morning. But my my desire is that, that we could see Christmas without throwing all the traditions aside, but that those traditions could be transformed and that they would they would point us to the greater reason for Christmas, the real reason for Christmas, the only reason that Christmas is and should be big in everybody's household, especially believers. If you're not familiar with Luke, the man who wrote the book of the Bible that we are going to be looking at this morning, uh, this is a gospel that bears his name. Luke was a doctor who planted churches with the Apostle Paul. Uh, He wrote this gospel as well as the book of Acts. Uh, Acts is really the the sequel, if you will, 
to Luke's gospel. Luke was not an eyewitness to the birth of Jesus. He was not an eyewitness to the ministry of Jesus. He, in fact, drew largely from Mark, whose gospel we're preaching on on Sunday mornings, and we'd love for you visitors uh, to come back and, and study the gospel of Mark with us next uh, the beginning of the year. But he relied mostly on eyewitness accounts. And in his record of Jesus' birth, we, we find the ingredients to what should make a big Christmas for us all. So if you'll stand, we're going to read verses 1 through 20, and then we will jump right into the text, discovering what it is that makes Christmas truly big. Luke writes, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold... I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered, at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. You may be seated. Please pray, for, pray with me and for me. <laughs> Lord, we were exhorted earlier to forget about the plans of the next two days. Not because the things we engage in are inappropriate. Christmas time and the blessings and traditions that come with it are a blessing from you. But Lord, that is our prayer, that we could right now forget about the next two days. Forget about the people that we will be sitting around the fire and join. Forget about the gifts that will be opened. Forget about the food that we'll be eating. Forget about what we can do with a couple days off work. Lord, help us to forget about those things because you have drawn these people here to hear from you through your word. Lord, the fact that we have the Bible, your spoken word, is a reminder that you are a God who communicates. You are a God who desires to communicate himself to people. And so we, we recognize that, and we now ask that you would capture our attention, that you would give us a single focus at what you have to say about Christmas in your word. Holy Spirit, cause our hearts to be captured, convicted, and encouraged with your word this morning. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, whose birth we celebrate this morning. Jesus, the Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Well, the first thing that I want you to see in Luke's gospel is that Christmas is big because it is the fulfillment of God's biggest promise. If you're taking notes, if you like taking notes, I have three points this morning. And the first one is this, Christmas is big because it is the fulfillment of God's biggest promise. The, the first seven verses, if you noticed as we read uh, this together, the first seven verses of Luke's account is filled with what is seemingly insignificant, ordinary details of a family trip. Did you notice that? In verses one through three, we, we learned that, that Caesar ordered a worldwide census for taxation purposes. And of course, uh, they didn't make that easy. That, that wasn't necessary. That, those things happen. We, we, we have census. We, those things happen today. Uh, they didn't make it easy back then. Mary and Joseph, you'll notice in the first three verses, said that they, they had to travel for this census. There, there was no emails back then. There, 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 were, uh, nobody, there was nobody knocking on your door with a clipboard, signing you up and taking uh, your name and your age. You had to make this trip to your ancestral hometown on your own. And for Joseph, that meant a trip to Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the hometown of Joseph. And, and I want us to just put this trip for a moment into perspective because when you read this, if you're paying attention, it's a, a, a logical question is why did they make this trip? There's no human reason for them to make this trip. This trip probably was a foolish trip for them to make, in fact. So I wanted to stop and put this trip in perspective. Bethlehem was about 75 miles south of Nazareth. That's where Mary and Joseph lived, but they, they had to register their names in Bethlehem. So this is a 75 mile track. Now I did some math. An average person can walk about three miles an hour if the terrain is easy. And then if you, if, you, if you have the ability to keep that pace for 10 hours a day, you're probably looking at just over a two-day trip. But that's a, that's a good clip, okay? That's a good clip. Now I want you to think about making this trip that uh, Mary and Joseph made across rough terrain because this was mountainous terrain between Nazareth and Bethlehem. The two-day trip could easily have become at least a week-long journey, especially when you remember that Mary is with child. Mary is pregnant. She is far along in her pregnancy. And Joseph is taking her out to hike Mount Lemon, if you will, almost. And so this, this, this is no mere two-day trip. This is probably a week-long journey. If Joseph and Mary went to their doctor and explained what was going on and said, do you recommend that we make this trip to Bethlehem? I'm pretty confident the doctor would say, no, Joseph, you go. Mary, you stay home. That this would be an unwise trip for you to make. And so as we read these details in the first few verses, a good question to ask is, what compelled Joseph to take his pregnant wife who's ready to give birth on such an ill-advised trip. Well, I think it could be that perhaps Joseph just didn't want to miss the birth of his son, right? Who, who wants to miss the birth of their firstborn? Or it could be that Joseph and Mary, they saw it as an opportunity to get away from the small town gossip. You can imagine all the corner conversations you know that young girl, Mary? Yeah, she's pregnant. Joseph apparently is the father. They're not even married. So that, that you, we, we, could, we could find some reasons that would make sense for Joseph and Mary to go on this trip. But whatever human factors influence this trip that we see in these first few verses, when we take a closer look, we see that this is God working out his big plan for the promise of Christmas. We sang that song. The children sang that song. God's plan to save the world. 
This itinerary, itinerary, if you will, that Luke puts forth, it reveals God's providential arranging of world events to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem at the right time. Bethlehem was important. How, how does Joseph get Mary to the small town of Bethlehem that's 75 miles away over rough terrain when she is probably in her ninth month of pregnancy? This is God ordaining world events. He's ordaining history. He's ordaining that there would be a census. And we know that because there's a 750-year-old prophecy in the book of Micah. You don't have to turn there. It'll be uh, behind me. But Micah 5.2 says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, but you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me, one who's to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. This passage is a prophetic promise that the Messiah who would come from the lineage of David would be born in Bethlehem. And if you come to the candlelight service tomorrow, I believe there's going to be a sermon just on this text and all the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. So if you want to understand Micah 5, 2 in a deeper way, come tomorrow night. But for right now, the point is that what Caesar, what Caesar saw as a tightening of his grip on the world through a census, what, what Caesar saw as a, as a power play to, to control the people, God had ordained as an unleashing of his promised events that would turn, turn the world upside down. The prophecy is that the Messiah, the one who would come to save people from their sins, would be born in Bethlehem. And God ordained through normal, ordinary human events like a census that this would be the time where his son would enter this world as a baby. And so what we see here is that Christmas reveals the faithfulness of God. We're reminded the fact that that Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem and didn't have Jesus in Nazareth is a reminder of the Old Testament prophecy, the one from ancient who would come, and God is being faithful to that promise. And this is a wonderful reminder. This is not only why Christmas should be big in our hearts, why Christmas should be big for us as believers in particular, why Christmas should be big for you, even though you might not know Jesus. Because Christmas, Christmas is, 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 is a revealing, it's a promise kept of God's biggest promise made. But it also should remind us of this. It should remind us that God is not just faithful to the big picture. God is faithful to you as well. God is, God is a faithful God to his people. He, he doesn't, didn't just create a plan and, and, and wind it up and let it go, removed. God is at work. God is at work in the details of life. And Christmas reminds us of that. The Christmas season reminds us that God is faithful. Listen, what burdens did you bring to this service this morning. Maybe you're ending this Christmas and you're in financial ruin. Maybe you're ending this Christmas and, and you're not going to that family gathering because there is a, a, an unresolved relational conflict that is, that's a wearing on your heart today. Maybe, maybe your health situation. You weren't even sure you're going to be able to make it to Christmas this year. And even as you sit here, your body is racked with pain. It hurt getting out of bed and coming here this morning. Maybe you're political and the political winds and what's happening in D.C. and around our country and around this world weighs on you. It, it breeds fear in you. You're wondering, does God, does God even know? Listen, Christmas reminds us that 
God is a faithful God. Christmas is proof of his character, that he is faithfully working out his will according to his unchanging purposes and promises. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher, said, what God did when he sent his son into the world is an absolute guarantee that he will do everything he has promised to do. This world is not out of control. Your life is not spiraling out of control apart from anybody's control. God is a faithful God. I don't know what his faithfulness looks like to you in your life today, but I know because this book, the Bible, tells me that he is at work. And if you're visiting with us this morning and, and maybe you're not even a Christian, you're wondering, what, why am I here? Well, I can't tell you all the circumstances, all of the, of the practical human influences that got you here this morning, but I can tell you this, you're not here apart from God's leading and guiding, even if you don't understand it, so that you could be here to hear about the real, true, life-transforming message of Christmas. So that's the first thing that Christmas reminds us of, the faithfulness of God. It's the first reason why Christmas is big. The second is that Christmas is big because it's the remedy for our biggest problem. Notice verse 8. Notice what Luke says in verse 8. He says, and in the same region where shepherds were out in the field, keep you watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And then he says this, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior has been born in Bethlehem, who is Christ the Lord. It was wonderful seeing all the kids up here this morning, wasn't it? And I'm assuming that each one of them had some kind of birth announcement. I don't know what, what the birth announcement of your children or your child looked like, but I know for Dawn and I and our three children, uh, none of our birth announcements included angels, blinding lights, and preaching. I think it's safe to assume yours didn't either. But then again, what we see here in Luke 2, verses 8 through 11, is no mere birth announcement. It's a proclamation. This is no ordinary birth, and this is no ordinary birth announcement. Jesus may have been born in poverty and obscurity, but what's happening in this little town of Bethlehem was the biggest event in the history of the universe. God in flesh. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. For unto you is born in this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is the first time in Scripture that we see those two titles, Christ and Lord, strung together. And the implications are tremendous. The title Christ means the anointed one. It, it refers to the promised Messiah, the one that the Old Testament continually pointed toward, the one that the, the saints of the Old Testament continually prayed for and looked for, the one who would come to save his people. The title the Lord points to the baby's deity, his sovereignty, In other words, these angels are saying, this is the one that everybody has been waiting for, the one that everybody has been looking for, the one who was promised by God from ancient days, and it is God himself. It is 
God incarnate. It is God in flesh. It is Emmanuel, God with us. This is the good news of great joy of Christmas. This is why Christmas is big. Because God himself has become a man to save his people. How? How big is that? The one the priests foreshadowed, the one the sacrificial system in the Old Testament pointed to, the the one the prophets predicted, the one the people prayed for was none other than God in human flesh. What a big birth announcement. A Savior has come. This baby will do what no other human being or no law could ever do. Deliver sinners from their sin. Save the spiritually dead from death. He will save his people. Now the fact that the angels announced Jesus as a savior needs to be paid attention to. Because it tells everyone who reads that something about themselves. It reminds us that the birth before before the Christmas story is good news of great joy. It is bad news of great grief, if you will. Christmas implies that you need a Savior. Christmas, Christmas implies that something's not right with any of us. It implies that, that we are in trouble and that we need someone to rescue us. That's what a Savior does. A Savior rescues. A Savior comes and rescues somebody who can't rescue themselves. They need to be acted upon. They need somebody to initiate toward them. They need somebody to come to them and deliver them. Matthew's account of Jesus' birth reminds us what we need to be saved from and ultimately why Jesus was born and why he lived and why he died on a cross, and why he was raised from the grave on the third day, and why he ascended to the right side of to the to the right hand of God. Matthew one says, "She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for see for he will save his people." <coughs> Excuse me. Notice what it says: He will save his people from what? Not bad politics. Not chronic pain. Not financial ruin, not parenting failures, not relational disappointments, not social injustices, not world hunger, not global warming. What does it say? He will save his people. She will bear a son. You should call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You know, sin is just when we don't live according to the character of God. Sin is anything that we think or say or do that is inconsistent with who God is and what he has given us as his purposes and and ways in his word. And Bible says we are all guilty. That means this Savior is for every one of us. Doesn't matter how well you're doing in life. Doesn't matter how well you've been blessed in life. We all are sinners, Scripture says. Romans 3 says that for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And need a savior. See, this, this, oh, this is what makes Christmas relevant. This is why Christmas matters. This is why Christmas is big because it's about it's about God giving us what we need most: Himself in the form of Jesus, in the person. Scratch that. Not in the form of Jesus, but in the person of Jesus. 
who could save us from our sin. We're separated from God because of our sin. We live, no matter how much you may or may not feel it or sense it, we all live under divine and eternal punishment because of our sin. That's a big problem. It's the biggest problem that every one of us have. It's the biggest issue in our lives that needs to be remedied. It's the biggest condition that we have that needs to be turned around before you die and pass from this world. Because there's another world where sinners go. Sinners either go to heaven or they go to hell. And the only difference between heaven and hell is that heaven is filled with unforgiven, or I'm sorry, with forgiven sinners. And hell is a place where unforgiven sinners go. Heaven is the place not where the good, righteous, moral people go. The, 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 heaven is the place where those who God came and saved them from their sins go. If you're in heaven one day, it's all because of Jesus. It's not because of how you lived or what you did. And so Christmas is relevant for all of us because we all have this problem. And yet we see here from the angels that the good news of the great joy of Christmas is that this baby, God incarnate, was born in a manger so he could grow up perfect and die as our sin substitute on a cross. I love how J.C. Ryle explains the wonder and the bigness of Christmas and what truly was happening here in Bethlehem. He says, the spiritual darkness which had covered the earth for 4,000 years, was about to be rolled away. The way to pardon and peace with God was about to be thrown open to all mankind. The head of Satan was about to be bruised. Liberty was about to be proclaimed to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. The mighty truth was about to be proclaimed that God could be just and yet, for Christ's sake, justify the ungodly Salvation was no longer to be seen through types and figures, but openly and face to face. The, God, the knowledge of God was no longer to be confined to the Jews, but to be offered to the whole Gentile world. The days of heathenism were numbered. The first stone of God's kingdom was about to be set up. If this was not good tidings, there, were, there never were tidings that deserved the name. Christmas is big because it gives us what we need, a Savior who will save us from our sins and, as the angel said, will give us peace with God. That's our third point. Christmas is big because it reveals our biggest person in life. Notice Notice that this angelic birth announcement is immediately followed by an angelic doxology or this angelic worship that really puts Christmas in perfect perspective for us. Notice what it says in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Verse 14 tells us that the heart of Christmas is God's glory. It's God's glory. The psalmist says that the heavens declare God's glory, doesn't he? We see God's glory in the, the smallest flower, the, the highest mountain range. We see his glory in the, in the Imago Dei, the image of God in mankind. But nothing reveals God's glory more than the riches of his grace the depths of his mercy and the boundless nature of his love that is shown 
to us through this baby boy, Jesus. Who according to the angels in verse 14, his life would bring peace to sinners who put their faith in Jesus. Have you ever noticed how common peace on earth and goodwill to men is on a Christmas card, a Hallmark card? It's a great message, but why? How? Have you ever seen that same Christmas card add to that glory to God in the highest? I haven't, but I've researched it. See, the world doesn't understand that those two go together. They don't understand the nature of peace that the angels are talking about. Peace is just something that we wish on one another. Peace on earth, goodwill to one another. But what does that mean, and how do we get there? And what's the ultimate purpose? Is it for my comfort and convenience? Is it for my personal reputation, my my, my, my ego to feel good about myself, to, to live life as free as possible from difficulties and struggles? It, it, does it mean that, that there, there's no, no, no animosity between the Middle East and the Western world? Does it mean that all political parties just get along and, and there's never any hostilities in the, in the capital? Does it mean that, that we just all live with one another in love and whatever you believe is right because you believe it and, 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 and nobody challenges or questions anybody? Is that the kind of peace that we're talking about? For too many it is. But that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here transcends any peace that we could know in this world apart from God. That this peace that the angels are proclaiming, it's, it's, it's not a temporary outward peace between men and women, between nations. It's not a temporary outward peace that, that, that is manifested in an absence of trials. It, 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 is an inward, etern, it is an inward, eternal tranquility that comes from knowing this baby boy, Jesus, personally. That comes from knowing that, that this baby would go from a manger to a cross where he would take our sins upon his shoulders and he would stand in our stead before the throne room of God receiving our punishment for our sin. Though he was sinless himself, the scripture says repeatedly, 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you've never read it, read it. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That means he he took our sin, he took my sin upon his shoulders, and he stood before God and he said, punish me, not Derek. And he wouldn't just suffer physically on the cross, but the Father, his Father, our Father in heaven, the one whom he had perfect Trinitarian fellowship from eternity past with, would look at him as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God's response was to only continue to pour out his wrath on Jesus for our sins. And Jesus was not just crushed physically. He was crushed spiritually. The eyes of his father were eyes that he wasn't used to because suddenly when his father looked upon him, he looked upon him as if he had committed every sin 
that every human being had ever committed. Jesus said, it is finished. And when God rose Jesus from the grave three days later, it was God's way of saying, it is sufficient. It is enough. All who will believe in my son, all who will turn from their sin and put their faith in my son, the spotless lamb who was slain for sinners, they will be forgiven. I will look upon them as I look upon my son Jesus and accept them and receive them as mine forever. These angels were naturally scared, understandably scared in uh, what verse is it? In verse 9. And the angel said to them, fear not. That should be all of our natural response when we consider a holy God and who we are. But this peace that the angels talk about, it comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that removes the fear of God's wrath, that removes the fear of God's judgment, that removes the fear of an eternity, of being punished for our sins. And that is a real statement, ladies and gentlemen. I know it might not seem real. We can't feel it right now. We can't fathom it right now. We can't touch it right now. But it is real. It is real. That fear, that dread of death, that fear of God's wrath is removed, and that is big. And it allows us to do what we were created to do. The angel said, glory to God in the highest. Jesus was born for our good. but it was ultimately for God's glory. This is what you were created for, what the angels are doing. Look at that text. You see the angels are praising God. You see the angels are exalting God. Glory to God in the highest. The shepherds later on, they go praising God and glorifying God for all that they had heard. Mary, you see her, she is treasuring up these things in her heart. She's giving glory to God for her son, Jesus, as, as these people begin to understand what is happening. And we join them. We will join them one day in a way we can't even begin to fathom, but we join them today. This is why we're here, because as ones who, whose sins have been forgiven, as one whose fear has been removed, no fear of God I dread, only his grace and mercy and love I know. Why? Because of how well I live? No, because I throw myself at the feet of this baby. I put all my weight for my standing before God upon him. It's called faith. I trust in his perfect life and his substitutionary death. I trust that, that I will have peace with God, not because of what I do, but because of who I am in Jesus. See, this little baby born in poverty and a dirty, grungy manger, he's the only one who can take the sinner all the way to heaven. Because no one gets to his father apart from him. That was his claim. That's big. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're agnostic, not sure what to believe about God. Maybe you're an atheist. You're just here to appease a friend or a family member. Maybe you are a believer, but you're struggling with unbelief. You're a struggling Christian this Christmas. I want to encourage you. This, this account is here so that you could have certainty and know that Jesus, Jesus 
is your only Savior. If you read the first three verses of Luke's gospel, he's writing this to a man named Theophilus. And he says to Theophilus, I am putting together an, order, an, an orderly report for you of the things that I have heard and received from others. In other words, I'm telling you about Jesus in a very logical, progressive manner. And here's why. So that you may have certainty of what you have heard. So that you may be certain that Jesus is who he said he is. So that you may have certainty that the faith that you have put in him, it is real, it is right. Don't stray from it. So that you, struggling believer, can know that in Christ, nothing in this world can separate you from his love. So that you, atheists, can know this is real. This is in the history books. This is part of world history. This isn't just Christian history. This isn't just church history. This was spoken of hundreds and hundreds of years before, indeed thousands of years before in the book of Genesis. Jesus came doing things and saying things, and in particular, he came predicting he would die, be crucified and raised in three days, and it happened. You better take a man like that serious. Christmas reminds us. Christmas should give us certainty. But this one born in a manger, he is the one. Not just that people were waiting for, but he is the one that you need. He is the one that you need. Believer or unbeliever, whatever you think you need most this Christmas, I implore you, you need Jesus more. There's nothing else you need. He came. He came and was born in a manger. The prophets foretold him. The people prayed for him. And on Christmas morning, here he is. And the angels declared it. Glory God in the highest. Peace to all men whom God is pleased with. That is, who have faith with in Jesus. For unto this day, in the city of David, Bethlehem, just as it was prophesied 750 years ago, your Savior is born. And he is the Christ, Christ the Lord, God himself in flesh. Let's pray. Lord, you know the hearts of men and women in this room. You know where each person stands. You know what right now each person is thinking. Ah, myths and lies. Great sermon, preacher, but not for me. Or perhaps there are some here wondering, is this true? If it is, I, I need to find out. Lord, you know where the, the minds are right now. You know the thoughts running through people's heads. You, you know the emotions pulsing through people's hearts. I pray that your spirit right now would reveal yourself to everyone here, whether that's to give fresh faith and courage to the, to the, to the believer who's been living for you for years but struggling, or it's to the one who is just confused and not sure what to believe. Or it's the person who has rejected you repeatedly and clearly. Lord, may be, this be the time that Christmas becomes big, that Christmas becomes real. Use this Christmas to draw people to yourself. For that work only you can do. And so we ask you to do it. For our good, most of all, for your glory. In Jesus' name.
Amen.